All right, welcome everyone. Uh, right now, I just want to let everybody know, thank you for, uh, for coming this evening. Um, the way we're going to do this is uh, everybody will be muted. And uh, if we do get to uh, a potential question and answer period, then uh, that's, that's when we'll, we'll be able to unmute you. So uh, thank you so much for, uh, for coming this evening and being a part of this town hall. Uh, what I be believe is an important town hall to, to really have these honest conversations around everything that's happening right now. Um, and in my opinion, this is just the start of a conversation that is long overdue and, and a conversation that's been going on for years without probably enough action. Uh, so um, if you are new to Zoom, uh, let me just give you some guidelines here. Um, typically at the very bottom of your screen, there is a little button that says participants. If you uh, hit that button, it'll fly out a window to your side and you'll be able to see all the different people that are uh, taking part in the meeting. Uh, usually at the bottom of that participants list is a, uh, is, are, are a few buttons. One of them is raise hand. So if, if there eventually is a time where we get to questions uh, and you want to ask one, just click the raise hand button and then that I'll let the uh, panelists know that you want to ask a question. Um, there's also a chat window. You can always enter uh, information in there as well. Um, so, uh, as I briefly alluded to, you know, why are we having this town hall? And I think uh, the events that have transpired in the past few weeks uh, in Minneapolis uh, are shocking to all of us um, and, and depressing at the same time. Uh, you know, over the course of my lifetime, I've felt like I've been an ally, and and now I even question: Am I uh, an ally to uh, to our African American community? Uh, a few years ago, I, I went to go see Senator Sanders speak downtown, and uh, didn't realize that I was actually going to a a criminal justice and social justice reform uh, talk with Black Lives Matters and a variety of other people, and I left I left that. Um, that meeting and came home and I, and I said to my wife, I, I feel like I'm not doing enough. You know, I'm, I'm not doing anything. I just, I felt like, how are we going to improve as a society? Um, and I know that this meeting is not going to, uh, going to fix all the ills that we do need to fix systemically. Uh, but I, I hope that as a community, we can actually be a part of the solution and that other communities around the South Bay, around the country, around the state, uh, begin doing the same and start a process of healing and uh, reconciliation and fixing uh, fixing the aspects of the system that are clearly not working. Um, so with that said, I'm going to now introduce our panel. Uh, I'm amazingly grateful uh, that each of them has agreed to be here tonight and to share their story, lived experience, uh, and, and have uh, you know an intimate conversation with each other. Um, and I want to thank Tanya McKenzie for helping me uh, to to put this together. So I'm going to start with her bio just to give everybody out there a little bit of background on, on who's joining us tonight. So uh, our first panelist is Tanya McKenzie. As the founder of Sand and Shores, Tanya McKenzie brings more than 20 years experience in communications and public relations. She has served as the first black elected director for the Oakley Chamber of Commerce in the Bay Area and on the Youth Council for Contra Costa County. She currently serves on the Redondo Beach Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, the Redondo Beach Police Department Community Engagement Board, the General Plan Advisory Committee, and as the president of the North Redondo Beach Business Association. Tanya chartered a graduate chapter of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated in Northern California and serves as the vice president for Black Public Relations Society Los Angeles. She is the host of the podcast, Content is Queen, and co-host of My Morning Coffee. This alumnus of California State University Northridge has four amazing kids, including a set of twins, and has been married 19 years. You can find Mrs. McKenzie highlighted in the book Amazing Moms, Parents of the 21st Century, and in her first memoir, A Child's Memories of Cartoons and Murder. Tanya serves as a voice for those that need amplification and always strives to simplify complex issues through conversation. Our next panelist is Dr. Joseph Lee. 
Uh, Dr. Joseph Lee lives with his family here in the South Bay and has been a business owner in Redondo Beach for the past 15 years, working in private practice as a psychiatrist and therapist. In addition to that, he is a frequent public speaker to diverse audiences, including parents, educators, and faith communities, talking about social, emotional learning, relationships, personal development, and mental health. He is a second generation Chinese American. Our third panelist is Janelle Scales. Janelle Scales is a scholar and educator with a particular passion for justice, she focuses on the many facets of community building. Through direct action, essays, and dialogue, she examines social structures and challenges the status quo. As a champion for the voiceless, she encourages empathy, transparency, and accountability. Keith Kaufman. Chief Kaufman started his career with the Hawthorne Police Department in 1994. As a patrol officer, he received the Medal of Valor in 1995 and again in 1996. Keith worked a variety of assignments and eventually promoted the sergeant in 2000, lieutenant in 2005, and captain in 2008. In 2011, the Hawthorne Police Department was looking for better ways to build trust in the community, and they started showing up unannounced at local coffee shops, McDonald's, Starbucks, or donut shops. They would sit and talk with community members about whatever came up. No agenda, no barriers, no stress of the town hall type meeting. They used coffee as the vehicle to open up the dialogue and start the conversation. They called it Coffee with a Cop. Coffee with a Cop is now in all 50 states, 15 different countries, and is arguably the most widely used and effective community policing program in the United States. Keith left Hawthorne after 22 years and was hired as the police chief in his hometown of Redondo Beach. Chief Kaufman has a BA degree from UCLA in Spanish literature and an MS degree from Cal State University Dominguez Hills in negotiation and conflict management. Keith graduated from Command College in 2014 and received the Dorothy Harris Award for his published article. And our final panelist is uh, Marcus Goody Goodlow, PhD. A Compton, California native, Dr. Goodlow travels around the country mentoring students and educators, business professionals, athletes, entertainers, and faith communities on a range of issues, including cultural and interpersonal relationships, leadership, team and synergy, character formation, and faith. Goody heads up the pastoral care team at Wave Church LA, California, and has served as teaching pastor at Parkcrest Church in Long Beach, and as an adjunct professor at Dallas Baptist University in Dallas, Texas since 2012. He currently serves on the Community Engagement Board for Redondo Beach Police Department while continuing to work with members of the law enforcement community, as well as community activists in efforts to foster better understanding and education on matters of fairness and justice with respect to the judicial system and cooperative policing. He is the author of the book Kingmaker, applying Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s leadership lessons in working with athletes and entertainers, and co-author of Habits, Six Steps to the Art of Influence. Goody and his wife of 22 years, Lucy, live in the Los Angeles area and have two children. Welcome to the panelists. At this time, I'm going to sit back and do what the rest of the audience is doing and listen, and I'm going to let Tanya take over from here. All right? Go ahead, Tanya. Go for it, No, I want to thank everybody for um, being here today. I think it's a pretty important conversation that we have as a community. Uh, everyone that's here will have an opportunity to, if you don't get a chance to ask your question, if you have a question, um, we will leave our contact information for Councilman Christian Harvath to put on the feed so that you have to ask to us individually. Okay? Um, and I want to go ahead and kick this off with Dr. Judy Whitlow talking about his experience on the ground after the incident. Um, I think it lends uh, a high level of compassion to this conversation, and then we'll um, we'll go from there. So uh, if you don't mind, Goody, take it away. Well, thank you so much uh, to our host, Tanya, and thank you, Council Member, for inviting us to be a part of this discussion and for your leadership on these pressing issues of our time. Uh, I want to also acknowledge the rest of the members of this distinguished uh, panel and all of those who are listening uh, today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, indeed, I spent a few days in Minneapolis, Minnesota on the ground uh, just a couple of Saturdays ago. Uh, like many of you, I uh, was in my home and taking all the events in and felt uh, compelled uh, to do more. I wanted to do more. I wanted to lean in. Uh, engage and try to discover and 
try to understand the complexities of, uh, of the issues. Uh, I've actually been to Minneapolis, Minnesota five times to do leadership training, to do leadership development with several companies and organizations. And so I had a somewhat of an affinity for that community. So I jumped on a plane uh, all of about 48 hours notice. And by a Saturday, two Saturdays ago, I was literally at the place where George Floyd was murdered. Uh, like, uh, like I said, many of you, I was, um, for many reasons, uh, obviously disheartened. Uh, this was not a tragedy. Uh, this is not an unfortunate event. Unfortunate events happen when I spill coffee on my nice shirt. Uh, this was, uh, this was a heinous crime that was committed at the hands of people charged to protect and to serve. And so I wanted to bear prophetic witness, uh, to the events that were happening on the ground. I talked with people, visited with people. Uh, business owners, community leaders, uh, people who lost uh, property as a result of some of the uh, damage that happened thereafter, people who are really hurting. Uh, there was a lot of pain in the community. Minneapolis has a unique history with law enforcement, uh, its citizens. Uh, just even in recent years, uh, they've had some challenges. In fact, the current chief who's now in place came as a result of uh, some attentions that happened within the community of Minneapolis, Minnesota. So my role was to listen, uh, to engage, uh, to pray, to reflect, uh, and to try to come to some understanding of clarity in terms of a way forward uh, for uh, not only that community, but really uh, what has happened literally across the nation and even our world, dare I say, people have leaned in or expressed uh, uh, their opinions and their disdain, their support, their encouragement, and have uh, on these issues that we're facing. So anyway, I spent about 72 hours there, and um, I'm hoping to uh, in some way uh, be an uh, influence to continue to work with our department here and others in order to advance, uh, I think, our communities forward. Goody, what, Goody, what were some of your takeaways, the most dynamic takeaways from that experience? You know, uh, as I mentioned, you know, Minneapolis, Minnesota has a, a has a unique, um, unique experience, a unique, unique history with regard to issues of law enforcement. You know, uh, they have had uh, issues related to uh, excessive use of force. Uh, they have had a number of different uh, cases. Uh, I was just looking up some statistical uh, information when I was there on the ground and talking with some of their leaders, some of the people there in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, you know, as recently as, um, you know, they have a budget of about $197 million or so uh, that goes to their police department. Over 90% of the officers do not live in the community uh, in which uh, in which they police. And uh, one of the things I also discovered, too, was in addition to the individual officer who was responsible for the murder of George Floyd, uh, we found uh, we found issues related to uh, uh, frequent stops uh, disproportionately impacting people of color uh, when use of force has been used, disproportionately impacting people of color. So these are some things and conversations, some um, things I came uh, came in, in, into the knowledge of as a result of some research and talking with the people there on the ground. And so this is not something that happened in a vacuum. Uh, I think anyone has been paying attention to the news, certainly in the events there, but coming to an understanding of their recent history even, uh, would have a great appreciation for this not being something that just kind of popped up. There has, it's a very diverse community, by the way, Minneapolis, Minnesota, surprisingly so. Uh, I saw that on the ground. I knew of that from my time there previously and the various areas in which I visited a uh, very, very diverse uh, uh, immigrants, people of color uh, from all walks of life. I uh, had a chance to visit with. So some, those are some of my takeaways. Just you know, left uh, left feeling challenged, yet feeling encouraged. Seeing people coming together there, unfortunately, to clean up uh, some of the damage that had been done uh, in the aftermath. Uh, people were coming to grieve, coming to mourn, not just the destruction of property, uh, but also what has been a continued struggle and challenge for so many people, particularly people of color, uh, with regard to issues of law enforcement. So those are some observations that I have. So uh, before we move on, I've decided to share a story um, with you all that I probably have never told anybody other than my husband. 
When I moved to Redondo Beach, uh, many of my friends uh, from Southern California, I went to Cal State Northridge, even though I'm from the Bay Area. So a lot of my friends live in LA. We moved to Redondo Beach. My husband chose this area. He moved out here before I did. And he chose Redondo for the schools. We had decided, um, you know, he's from middle California, mid Cal, I call it the armpit of California, Modesto. He's from Atwa. So we decided if we moved back out here, we were gonna, you know, move to beach. I'm from San Jose. And um, so we chose Redondo. Many of my friends question that. You know, a lot of my friends live in Ladera and uh, the Crenshaw District and in and, and those types of areas. And they're just like, what? Or the Valley, right? Um, why Redondo? We, we don't live in Redondo. That, that was the sentiment. It's like, we don't do that. That's not a thing. So um, I was like, well, we do that because my kid goes, he plays basketball and Coach Morris was coaching here and they were winning. So that's all we focus on is our kids. That's our first priority. So outside of that, uh, uh, we moved here. But another girlfriend of mine, she's a member of Delta Sigma Theta. She lived here and she told me, hey, uh, watch out because Redondo police are really prejudiced. They're, they profiled my son before and they're very prejudiced. And I was like, okay. I listen, I take things with a grain of salt and I like to see for myself. So I found out for myself, um, but it's not what you think. I was driving to the gym one day. I go at about 4.30, 5 in the morning to the UFC gym. And I don't even think that it resonated with me that what she had said was in the back of my mind. So I'm on my way to the gym. I guess I'm speeding. I don't know. I get pulled over for speeding. But as soon as those lights blared to pull me over, I started shaking and then I started crying before he even got to the car to ask me for my anything. I'm in the car, I'm in my, you know, my uh, workout gear and I'm shaking and I'm crying. And he must have thought I was crazy because, you know, he's just coming to tell me I'm getting a speeding ticket or I'm going too fast and I'm shaking, I'm crying. I don't even know why I'm reacting the way that I am going to the gym, he pulls me over, I'm scared to death. I started realizing that this was right after the Stanza Bland thing and I have what my girlfriend has said to me in the back of my head. So I'm trying to do, okay, my hands are on the steering wheel, what, what do you want me to do? I'm scared. He was just like, you know what? I just wanted to let you know, you're speeding, just a warning, pay attention. And since you're going to the gym, which is something I should be doing, I'm just gonna let you off with a warning and don't do that again. Um, I sat there in that spot for so long and I cried for about 30 minutes and then I just went back home because I screwed up my whole workout. But in that moment, I realized that what people say to me, even if I'm being my best self, trying to put it aside to judge people on my own experience with them, it's still in the back of my mind, right? So in that moment, and the Sandra Bland thing had happened, and if you don't know what that was about, she had got pulled over for um, a broken tail light, and she wound up dead. So no one was charged for that either. And that was fresh in my mind. Um, but it goes to the point of PTSD is real, right? And you don't always have to experience something yourself for it to resonate with you. And because something had happened so tragic to someone that looked like me and someone had said something to me about these people that I was going to eventually encounter, it all came out at a 4.30 in the morning going down, um, was that 190th on the way to the gym. Had no idea why I was shaking and crying for a very long time. Of course, I went to talk to my therapist and you know we kind of worked through that. But I wanted to be transparent with you to let you know that I had my own moment of fear based on the color of my skin. Now, since then, I have definitely had some incredibly positive experiences with Redondo Beach PD. Love them to death, every single one of them. Very diverse group of people. Um, but everybody hasn't had my experience some people haven't had an experience at all and all they know is what someone else has told them. One. Two, reflecting on things that have happened recently or maybe in the past. 
So I think this is an opportune time for everyone to take a moment because we are lucky enough to have a department that does what they say they're gonna do, um, but you're not always gonna get pulled over in Redondo Beach, right? So some of the things that will be talked about might not be just Redondo Beach PD and it might just be a policing thing, but I did want to go ahead and just express my moment of fear driving while black, even though nothing happened. It's a real thing. It's not imaginary. You know, it's not made up. And that fear comes from somewhere. And in order for us to be able to deal with that, we actually have to talk about it. So I wanted to um, hand over to Janelle and see what her experience has been like being here in Redondo Beach, because we are a whole 3% um, in this city. So, you, you know, you, you got to have a little bit of a tough skin sometimes. And I just wanted to kind of get Janelle's thoughts on that and her experience living here in Redondo. Um, hi. So thank you, Tanya. I love living here in Redondo, to be honest. I um, I fell in love with this city. I brought my kids here. I met people at the park. I know the post, the people who work at the post office and the Trader Joe's. And um, I have made a community here. It lacks diversity, <laughs> but I still have found a way to connect with my neighbors. I have experienced explicit racism here in Redondo Beach. Um, a particular time that I can remember was walking to pick my daughter up from preschool. And I actually had my youngest daughter in the stroller. She was about two. I was walking down Artesia, headed to Perry Park, and somebody screamed out the car at me, nigger. And that was the first time that it had happened to me. And I remember shaking and I couldn't understand why someone would see me pushing a two-year-old in a stroller and accost me like that on the street. And so although my overall experiences in Redondo Beach are, are great, I don't know who screamed at me. I don't know if it was a teacher or a police officer or a fireman or the post office, I, or the post, you know, somebody who works at the post office. I don't know who it is. So there, in this country, there's a history of anti-Blackness and racism. And there's no part of this country that it doesn't touch and it doesn't affect. I don't know if that person who screamed at me was my neighbor. And I just won't, I just won't know. And that is really the crux of it, even when it comes to interactions with the police, it's like you're playing Russian roulette. And that is not how we should feel as citizens, as humans, that we have to be on alert because we don't know what kind of person we're gonna come across. And I remember going to the school to pick my daughter up crying. And the mom who saw me first was like, what, your, your, your daughter's never heard that word before? And she didn't have any empathy for me, I guess because black people have used that word and we use it as slang and it's a, something, a word that we've used to, we've taken it over and now we don't use it in a way to demean each other. But when we hear from other communities, it's very demeaning. But she didn't have any empathy for me in that, in that situation. And it was odd for me to recognize that as someone who had just been accosted and then someone who lacked that empathy for me. And she was married to a Redondo Beach police officer. So all of these things, like the world is so small and as disconnected as we think we are to some things that are happening in the city of Los Angeles or in Minneapolis or in New York, all of those things affect us and, and who we are. And so I love this city, but addressing racism is a big passion of mine. And, and here in this city is where I've been hosting meetings talking about racism. And here in this city is where I'm doing organization, um, 
drives and 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 lectures because I believe that it's a pervasive problem in America and it's important that we talk about it and acknowledge it. So I love this city, but I have I have very a wide range of experiences. And that and this was the that was the first time I remember someone yelling it at me. And that was I mean just a few years ago. I can't hear you. I'm sorry, is that my Got it. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> I'm going to get it together. Dr. Lee, can you go ahead and speak on what those experiences do, not only to the people that it touches, but all the people around them, you know, the community? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, a couple of things I want to speak to. Um, and uh, so I'm... A psychiatrist. I have a therapy practice here in Redondo. I've been in the community for about 15 years. Um, so uh, that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. So when it comes to anxiety, trauma, depression, um, human suffering. All right. So this is what psychiatrists and therapists are. We're experts at. Uh, we know how people get hurt. We know how, what, what are the experiences that cause people to have, uh, why some people have resiliency and why some people don't. Um, that's kind of like the, the, the ins and outs of the job as a therapist and as a psychiatrist. In addition to that, I also speak regularly, uh, on a slightly wider topic regarding social emotional learning. And what that is, is talking to parents, educators, different groups about uh, emotions in general, what human relationships are supposed to be like when they're healthy, um, and what happens when we don't get to experience our emotions in healthy ways, or when we don't get to experience relationships in healthy ways. So I just want to give that background to, to, to where I'm going to speak from. So um, one of the things um, that's very different uh, it's an experience for someone who's black, person of color, versus somebody who's white, is that we live in a country where the majority of people are white. And, uh, and we live in a country that, um, especially coming from the white community, doesn't get race in the same way that people who are black or Asian American like me or Latinx, um, who live in a body that basically shows that we're of a certain race that's not white. And the analogy that I like to use is that uh, when it comes to race, um, people of color, we're the locals. We have a lived experience of being black, being Asian, being brown. And um, so to us, race is not a uh, abstract idea. It's not an intellectual idea. And if you're white, because you're in the sort of like majority culture, Race is not a huge pervasive part of self-identity and self-identity formation. So if you're learning anything about race, you're a tourist, right? So we got locals and we got tourists. Um, the thing about race is race in itself is not a problem. I am very comfortable being an Asian American. I have a history, I have a culture, I have a language. My parents were immigrants. They have the stories. Um, that story connects them to a country that has a culture that's thousands of years old. The food is good. Being Asian American, having a race by itself is a beautiful thing. It's a huge part of my identity. And the thing is, if you're black, you probably absolutely have this exact same experience of being black. Being black is not a problem for some black. It's also a beautiful thing. So when we talk about race, that's not an uncomfortable thing for a person of a race that's not white. However, um, here's a certain reality. Um, people who are white, because I don't think they have this sort of like culturally lived experience of that, don't get race in the same way as, as we do. And unfortunately, a lot of history with race as experience indirectly through people who are white is the experience of racism. Not race in itself, but the negative aspects of what people experience because of their race. And that's a very, very, very uncomfortable topic. One thing I want to speak to is oftentimes I, I am a parent educator. So um, 
as a reference. So this is a book called Nurture Shock. Uh, in chapter three of this book, it's a research-based book on parenting about children. And the third chapter of the book talks about why white parents don't talk to their kids about race. Um, and if they do talk to their parents, their kids about race, it's essentially like, in a nice way, they say, we don't talk about race. Let's be colorblind. We're all the same. We're all human beings. We all bleed red. You've heard all these kinds of things before. And they, if they do have a conversation with their kids about race, this is what they say. We should be colorblind. End of story. So that does a couple of things. So here's the problem. Kids as young as two to three actually start noticing these differences. As young as two to three, kids actually start noticing all sorts of things about different people. And one of the things that they notice is about the color of their skin. Not just color of the skin. Human beings are really, really intelligent. They actually notice the whole package of race. So they can actually tell that a light-skinned black person is still black, even if the actual, let's say, melanin color of their skin is lighter than a really tanned Asian or really tan white person, all right? So there's something about this complexity that we just get race as human beings. We just understand it. So kids as young as two to three. Now, my kids have heard about race and culture from a really young age because, like I said, this is embodied in their culture. It's embodied in their identity. It's in their family. And they notice these differences. So we've been having conversations about race forever. Um, why do families tend not to talk to their kids about race? And here's what happens. You have a vacuum for a child that... They don't have the language, they don't have the depth of understanding to know how to talk about race, which is something, again, that they know. And unlike parents that provide kids the information and give them a context as to what are serious things to know and not serious things to know, race is a very, very complex issue growing up. It's part of our socialization. It's part of how we make our way through the world, like we've been talking about here and current events. It's a source of pain and even death for some people because of the color of their skin. It's a deep, complex conversation. And if your parents are kind of like trivializing it, like, look, race is not a big deal. We're all human beings. Let's be colorblind. I don't see color. Neither should you. It's well-intentioned. But see, the opposite of racism is actually not to be colorblind. The opposite of racism is to be anti-racist to be against the institution and the experience and the systems and all the things that perpetuate racism. So being colorblind, we would say this in the context of therapy, it's an avoidance strategy, which is not a good one. It's, it makes me uncomfortable, so I don't want to talk about it. And in the context of therapy, when that happens, that stuff is still a problem just because you don't talk about it. In fact, it probably gets really bad later specifically because you don't talk about it. But what does this book say? This book says what ends up happening, unfortunately, is that because kids don't get this contextual understanding of race and the consequences, the good and the bad of it from their white parents, they still learn what they learn from their peers. They learn from stereotypes they pick up. And the nature of stereotypes about race is that they are shallow. But then these kids have indirectly been told by their parents that the conversation about race is a shallow thing. It's not a complex thing. It's not a deep thing. And then so to them, making jokes about race, making, you know, superficial stereotyped uh, judgments about people based on race, they pick it up and they can construct this. So I don't know if you guys have seen on social media pictures of, I don't know, disturbing pictures of the white teens reenacting the murder of George Floyd. Super disturbing, right? And I read these comments, and what I hear and I see is like people said, these kids must have been raised by racists, by Klansmen, by white supremacists. And when I see that as a therapist, as a person who teaches parents, I know that that's actually probably not likely to be true. What I know is that those kids probably had parents who in a very well-intentioned way said to them at some point when they were really young, here's what you need to know about race. Indirectly, they're saying it's not a big deal. We'll all be the same. Be colorblind. And so kids walk through life without an infrastructure, a context, conversations to think about deep, deeply and complexly about race. And they, and they keep and they hold on to a very superficial view of it. And it's a joke. And they don't get how this affects other people. It's not a, space for them to practice empathy, to think about how other people are different. So 
that's indirectly what I think that ends up looking like if we don't have conversations about race. So I can appreciate that we're doing it now, and we're doing this in the context of a national sort of conversation. We're doing this in the context of tragedy. And that's one side of it. The other side of it is the stories that, you know, other people have been telling here, that race is not an issue, but racism is something that people of color have been experiencing in their whole life, unavoidably. In their, and if not just them, the people that they know, their friends and their family. And as a therapist, again, when we talk about trauma, trauma is cumulative or single negative life experiences that basically shape what you expect from the world. It makes you pessimistic, it makes you negative, it makes you scared, it makes you cautious. And when you have lots and lots and lots of trauma, you can't help to be scared, concerned, but here's the thing when we talk about systemic racism, because it's such a constant experience, because the negative side of it is death, the negative side of it is harm, the negative side of it is pain. People who live in racialized bodies who are black or brown and have that fear, they're actually not paranoid. They're correct. So as Tanya and Janelle are sharing these experiences as to small incidences that trigger them into something that looks like a panic. Is that an overreaction? I don't think so. Because somewhere in the world, as they're telling their stories, that we're seeing videos now in the last few years, this is not new, we're just seeing it on video. This has been going on all the time. And so when they see that, even if the incident itself in front of them is not that bad, the reaction is appropriate. So the other side, I just want to finish this conversation is, and this is why we can also not say that we don't see color. As a police officer, if you see someone who's black, you should actually know that this person might have an extra strong traumatic experience. It doesn't matter that you as a police officer is a nice Redondo Beach police officer with no ill intention. If you see that, you see them, you should actually be extra careful. You should be extra sensitive. The empathy that Janelle did not get, you should give. And so this is the other reason why we actually can't have a colorblind society, because the reality is I live in an Asian body. I don't have a problem with this. I want to be seen as Asian. I want people to appreciate my culture. I want people to appreciate who I am. Same thing with people who are black, different things. This is not something that we want, actually. So hopefully we'll have conversations talk about other things too, but you know, just Flushing out the background, you know, as to why we have these conversations. When we have conversations about race, we actually want to talk about that racism is terrible. We also want to aspire to the idea that anti-racism is our goal. I appreciate that. Um, Keith, could you go ahead and, and jump in? One, give um, an update for what's going on currently in Redondo with our law enforcement community, um, how they're doing, because that matters also. And talk to us a little bit too about ex implicit bias training and how you actually carry that out in your department. Sure, thank you. Um, so the men and women of the Redondo Beach Police Department are doing great. Um, they were getting pretty tired. Uh, we all, just like everybody else, came off of um, COVID, which hasn't gone away. There's still a pan pandemic, although many seem to have forgotten about it. Um, but the stresses that that put on the agency um, for months were still there. And then all of a sudden we go into this new chapter of, um, of civil unrest. And so what that looks like from a police department standpoint is um, basically increasing of hours and resources and, and personnel to protect uh, people in Redondo Beach, protect property in Redondo Beach, but also be available to help our partners in policing throughout the county. So Redondo went into a 12 hour on, 12 hour off schedule, which means that literally half of the police department is working at any one time. We did that for um, just about a week. We came off of that schedule this weekend and we're starting to get back to back to normal. Um, but they're doing good, and I, I thank you for asking. Um, and I will also say that there has been a tremendous outpouring of support for the police department during this time. Um, 
maybe even more so than we were getting during COVID. So I don't want to give the false sense that uh, because there is this, uh, th this event happened in Minneapolis that caused civil unrest and now has all of these, these ramifications across the country, I don't necessarily feel that our own community um, is painting us with that exact same brush. Um, and I hope that the reason that that is occurring is because of the work we have put in on the front end. Um, Tanya, I know you've heard me say this before and Goody, you've heard, it, you've heard me say it too. Doing town hall meetings, having these discussions, super important. That's why I do them. Um, but these are difficult times to build relationships when tensions are high. There's a problem. Time to build it is when there's not a problem. And so I've dedicated my entire career um, and kind of my whole persona in policing is around community-oriented policing. Um, I've definitely been the outlier on that for most of my career. I've uh, been laughed at and, and humiliated and had people, uh, when we started Coffee with a Cop, tell me that was the most ridiculous thing in the world. Um, but what I have found, especially from policing uh, for 22 years in Hawthorne, was that a reactive approach, a band-aid approach to issues does not work. Um, the community involvement in the police department is the number one thing that I believe is the solution to the issue of police slash community relations. You can't build those relationships during that traffic stop when someone's headed to the gym. They're scared. Um, that's not the right time. The right time is when we invite Tanya to the community engagement board and we allow Tanya and Goody to dive into the police department to see who we are as people because just like no one in any of these squares wants to be judged by the color of their skin, I do not want to be judged by the badge on my chest. And when we, when we know one another, um, that's when the relationships are built. So that's how we're doing. And that is the philosophy behind um, what the police department does. And then very quickly, Tanya, the second part of your question uh, I would challenge everybody that's on tonight to take a few minutes and go to our police department's website, um, go to the police section, and you'll find a button called transparency. Um, in there will be a detailed list of many of the trainings that we do, um, also including implicit bias. We have, we have people that um, are trainers in that, um, we've taken those courses, we bring them back into our agency, and we have them train our agency, and we keep it at the forefront of what we do. We go through extra, um, we call it tactical communications, which is a de-escalation training. We don't do the minimum of what the state says, we do additional. And you can go through the, uh, the um, training, it's actually online. But one of the things that I think will really help um, paint the clearest picture of who we are as an agency is there is a document on there called 21st century policing and it really goes over our policing philosophy it goes over our vision and um and why we do things the way we do and if if, if you go through all of that you will see the mindset um that we have really worked hard to create within the men and women that work here um but i think that sums it up Tony. I don't want to take too much time. I want to ask you, though, um, with everything that has been going on, uh, many people want to know, are there any changes that you're looking at making with the department currently? And what would that look like? So more of what we're doing right here. Um, but I will tell you that I'm very proud that I don't feel like I'm playing catch up. A lot of agencies right now are playing catch up. They're saying, oh, look, here, I changed this policy. Um, therefore, we're doing better. I don't know that a policy is way different than a culture. And so since day one in my time here in Redondo, and it started way before I was here, I don't take credit for, for everything that's happened here. These are, these are great uh, men and women. but. I have stressed 
community policing. I have stress being one with the community. And I'll tell you what, it's not always popular. Um, lots of officers that get into this career are getting into it maybe for what they see on TV. And it's way different. And the way that the way that we police and our vision is we are the community. In other words, the public are the police and the police are the public. The difference between this agency and many others is not just that policy or those written words. It's the actions. It's the actions. It's the open book. It's the MLK bench bolted to the front of the station. It's coffee with a cop. It's the reorganization of the police department to pour resources into community engagement and proactive policing and relationship building and not being a reactive force out on the street. It's the relationship with the school district. It's trying to convince people, and many of them didn't believe it could be done, that the posture of the police should be, hey, it's awesome to see the police here, not the police are here, what's the problem? So our job is to put our men and women in front of the community frequently, often, and keep an open book so that the community feels that they can talk to us. Specifically, what have I done as a result of the events that have happened? Um, like everybody else, pouring into taking deeper dives into our policy and procedures. What have I mixed? What have I missed? Is there something we can be doing better? Um, yesterday, I suspended the use of the carotid restraint. You guys can ask me anything you want to know about that. Um, if you go to the fourth section in, in the transparency button of the website, you'll see how often it's used here. Um, so that, that policy was suspended yesterday. And there will be many other things. And I'm sure that my good friend Goody and Tanya, you and, and whoever else, will also continue to press and keep us moving in a direction where we continue this conversation. But the good news is, and what I want everybody that's watching this to know is we don't have to change everything. We can always do better, but we've been on the right path of engaging and being one with the community to develop solutions so that we don't have, um, so that we don't give people that fear that maybe Tanya felt. Um, we don't want to do that. Um, and there's lots of ways that we can uh, be better in policing. Some of those are through the use of technology, checks and balance systems, body worn cameras. Um, so policing has, has changed a lot since I started. And um, the thing that makes me most upset about what happened is I watched the video like every single one of you. Not a single person I know tried to justify it. We all denounced it. You may have seen what I what I wrote, um, but after I watched it, I thought to myself, here we go, my life's work. And now this has the potential of setting us back 30 years to when I started post Rodney King. And so that's, that's hard, but you know what? I'm here to fight uh, for the men and women in uniform that are doing the right thing day in and day out. Um, and people need to know that that's why we exist. I got into this job to bring people to justice, not to create injustices. And yes, people in my profession have screwed that up for me many, many times. Um, but nobody's more mad at a bad cop than a good cop. And uh, we will live um, our careers and finish our careers doing the best that we can to push our agencies and this this uh, great profession forward. When you say suspend this technique, I, many people thought that it was already eliminated. Or, so what's the difference between suspending it and alleviating it completely? And is that not something that you can do? Is that um, legislation? Like what, what aren't we understanding about that? Or any other technique that has been um, outlawed, why are some departments still doing it? Like walk us through that. Cause I think that's where a lot of confusion comes from 
from the public is what they hear is that we're not that's not supposed to happen and then it's a technique that they've seen in various other um, departments right so first of all what what we all saw in that video has nothing to do with a certified carotid restraint technique okay that what that was was a crime um, that has nothing to do with the way officers are trained to apply that hold. Um, we have always had our policy and procedure manual on our website for all to see. Um, you're welcome to go there and, and look through it and, and look at how we handle force and different things. Um, so why did I suspend it rather than remove it? One is because the application of the carotid restraint here in Redondo Beach has happened between zero and six times a year over the past five years. Um, that can be found in the use of force section on the transparency tab. And we have not had an injury due to it. Here's what, here's why it's in suspension until we can look at it further. And I'm always open for this conversation. I want to make sure that we train the men and women of the police department what to do that have been trained for their entire careers to use this in a certain in a certain circumstance i want to train them what do we do now because i don't want the removal of a policy to lead to more deadly force um, and so that's where it's being examined the the governor's directive to post which is the certification authority of, of policing in California was to suspend the use of the carotid restraint and decertify all of the training. And that's what was just done at the state level. So when we talk about improvements, and I know you have um, in your mind what you need to work on, I would like to ask the rest of the panel what they would like to see in the form of improvements. You might say none, you say everything's great. Uh, but I would love to hear from you uh, because for Chief, it's an objective opinion, right? So it's your view as a citizen. So what would you like to see, if anything at all, as a change or form of improvement for our department? Well, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, doctor, please. Um, I'll go. Uh, yeah, go again. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, there are some great studies out there that show when you use de escalation and you require it for departments, that it not only benefits and lowers the amount of lethal force for citizens, but it also um, lowers the amount of injuries to officers. So the removal of what you said, the carotid or the chokehold is one of those things. The um, requirement to use de-escalation is another one. And there's, um, you know, scorecards where they do, they've done a um, campaign zero has done a scorecard of a hundred police office, police departments in California and they do it like A, B, C, D, E, F. And what gets you an A is removing a lot of these things like being able to shoot at a moving vehicle, um, removing the chokehold or the carotid restraint, um, requiring de-escalation. And now I'm glad that Right now, Redondo Beach can check off one, but of the eight, our, that's, our police department only had two checked off. So from the research that I've been seeing, it not only benefits the community and the citizens to require officers to do de-escalation when the, as, as a requirement. And our, I've read through what you said, Keith, the, um, the policies and that that is not our policy here in Redondo Beach and I think that it needs to be and I think that is something that we should ask uh, as citizens because police officers are doing a lot 
you guys are doing more than you should be doing. You're, you're assessing mental illness and drug addiction and all these things that you were not trained to do. And so when you come across someone who maybe is having a break or um, an episode, your police officers who have not been trained in mental health are making assessments and reacting to people who are reactive. And if we can focus on de-escalation being the first priority, then a lot of the times, even the small amounts of use of force that you've mentioned, they can be eliminated. Because for me as a human being, I think of, sure, it's only three people, but if I'm one of that three, I'm very upset by that. If my child is one of that three, I'm very upset by that. So I really like to look at it as like, as an individual, and as the research says, decreasing the use of force and using these tactics not only helps the citizens, but it helps the police. And requiring the escalation is one tool that I think that Redondo Beach PD can do. But here in, in, in the policy, it says nothing in this policy shall be construed to limit an officer's authority to use reasonable force when interacting with a person in crisis. But that can be changed to whenever practicable, officers shall use techniques and tools consistent with the department de-escalation training. And that language changes how people interact with the community, especially when a lot of police officers are interacting with homeless community members who are um, overwhelmingly suffering from mental illness with addiction and um, people who are else are having breaks. So those are some of the um, things that I, I want to see in our, our police department, because I, I, I think even though the numbers are small, they can be smaller. Some departments, they have zero in theirs for the last six years. And I think those are the goals that we need to shoot for. Thank you. Let me respond to you real quick. So you have to look way beyond just the use of force section in the policy and procedure manual to make statements like our police are not trained in um, contacting people that are, uh, that are, you know, in crisis or our police officers are not trained in dealing with the homelessness. Um, nothing is farther from the truth. In fact, we have a ton of training in both of those categories because as society's problems avail themselves, Oftentimes, the police become the first response to those problems. Sometimes we are playing catch up, trying to train the men and women to handle those problems that would normally be handled by a social worker or something else in society. But when they're not available 24 seven, guess who goes? So to say that our officers are not trained is completely wrong. If you were to look at section 466.6, the de-escalation section, it starts off by saying officers should consider taking no action or passively monitoring the situation um, uh, that may be more reasonable response to a mental health crisis. So de-escalation is bred into everything that officers do. Many times the force options that are used by the police are chosen by the suspect. So it's not that officers always all the time come in at a high level. We are always taught to come in at a low level. Because I'll probably get more questions about um, the campaign zero uh, policies or the eight can't wait policies, the thing that you have to pay close attention to, it's not that I'm not in support of what those theoretical ideas are in the policy and procedure manual. In fact, I am. What we cannot do is paint our officers into a situation where it is a shall not, can never, or will all the time. What should one do when a gun is pointed at a police officer's face? Shall that require de-escalation before taking action? Shall that require a warning before taking action? Would putting a policy in place that doesn't have that nuance create additional force or additional injuries and death to police officers? That's one of the things that has to be examined. Same thing for shooting at a moving vehicle. To say that the policy should be, thou shall not shoot at a moving vehicle, 
Then you would want to go to Springfield, Illinois, yesterday, Tuesday, 9.30 a.m., and talk to those officers, one who was run over by a moving vehicle and then pinned against a ballard where the suspect was eventually shot. If you read Campaign Zero policy on moving vehicles, those officers would not have been able to do that. So we have to be very careful with the absolutes. Discussion on these policies and diving into them and, and seeing how scenarios would play out and then altering those policies within the confines of the state law and the federal law is a great idea. And that's why policy change goes through state legislation where it can be discussed with different people in the criminal justice system before it is just blanketed and put into action. Because so we have to be sure to protect the public and the men and women are the uniform. I just wanted to quickly say when I said that you weren't trained to do that, what I was saying is like what you said, you're not mental health professionals and a therapist, a psychiatrist, all of those people, like you said, those people have much more experience and training and education when it comes with dealing with people who are mentally um, ill or having breaks or episodes and things like that. So that that is what I'm saying is that police officers themselves are not trained mental health professionals, but they're dealing with people who have mental health issues. And 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 that is absolutely, absolutely a true statement. It, I mean, doc, Dr. Lee here, psychiatrist. I, yeah, I wanted to jump in on that. Yeah. So um, if I could do it in the context of a story that's it's very real. Um, so in my time here, um, in, in practice, I had uh, I had someone who uh, I had seen earlier in the week, bipolar disorder was in a manic state, very supportive family, all on his side, but he was in a bad state. Uh, we tried to get him to go to the hospital voluntarily. He didn't want to. Um, part of that was him in being, being manic. Um, so it was a really tough spot, and it's always a tough spot in outpatient sort of uh, mental health treatment when you find somebody who really needs to be in the hospital and they won't go voluntarily. So a couple of days later, I got a call from the dad, and uh, they got really agitated at home, and he punched his dad in the face. Uh, um, and it's and that's bad. The dad was okay, but we have these, we have the system in place called the 5150, which means that a person can go to the psychiatric hospital involuntarily if they meet certain criteria. If because of the of the psychiatric episode or illness, they're dangerous to themselves, meaning they're suicidal, or they're dangerous to other people, and there's a third criteria. But if they meet any of these criteria, um, we can put them on the psychiatric hold and they can be brought to the hospital. The way that it works right now in Los Angeles County is that the police are usually involved. And we still have this other system uh, where uh, a social worker or a mental health type person who's trained in this also arrives uh, if they can, if they're available. So the story goes like this. So that gets punched in the face. They call me. Um, and so uh, I told him, okay, look, you got to you gotta call the psychiatric mobile response team. Maybe you got to call the police. And as soon as anyone arrives, call me. I want to talk to them first. Okay, so this happened. Uh, so police arrive on the scene. This is local police. Um, and, um, and then uh, they call. The police officer is there. The dad's upset. He's like, they don't want to talk to you right now. They're trying to get the story. I said, okay, fine, fine, but they need to talk to me. So I talked to the officer and said, look, I'm the outpatient psychiatrist. He's got a diagnosis. He's currently manic. This is not who he normally is. This is a wonderful kid, great family. He punches down in the face. Clearly, he's not himself. Um, if he could be put on a hold and brought to the psychiatric hospital, I really appreciate it. He really needs the help. Um, unexpectedly, the officer told me, um, look, I need to talk to them myself. Um, I got to find out what's going on. Um, and I was kind of like, so I've had this training, uh, speaking of training and de-escalation, you know, my four years of psychiatry residency, when we're on call, this is all we're doing. We're making assessments of people who are dangerous to themselves, dangerous to others, if they need to go to the hospital all day long, hundreds of patients. This is a skill. It's a difficult skill, but it's one that I've spent hours and hours and hours of call doing. And it's very, very, very difficult. Okay, so I was trying to give this, like, I, I know this person well. He's my patient. 
Eventually, the officer got agitated at me and said, listen, I'm going to try to do my job. I don't need you to help me do my job. And I was like, whoa, what is going on here? And ultimately, the officer comes back because the father is upset and he's begging me. He's like, look, like the officer, you got to talk to the doctor again. And she says, look, he assaulted the father. I'm bringing him in. I was like, what is going on? I had to call the watch commander. Okay, eventually it got de-escalated. And the kid went to the hospital a couple of days later. Here's my experience. And I think this is what Janelle is saying. The police should not have been involved at all. At all. That's just not a situation. At all. At all. And I think people sort of with this kind of experience, you know, like there's a controversial term out there, right? And I deep on police. And it sounds crazy to some people. Like, what are we going to do, right? But the idea behind that is to say, and, uh, and, and, and look, I actually did my homework. I read the 21st Century Policing, the Redondo Beach Police Department report to the community. I read all of it. One of the sections says what everyone said, which is that police officers do more than they should. I think the report alone says 75 to 95% percent of what a police officer does has nothing to do with crime or crime prevention. And I think this is one of the roles that Dr. Uh, Chief Coffin said himself. He said, you know, uh, we get the training, we do these things, but there's a lot of things that police officers do. And so one of the facets, right, so if we can just imagine this, not on a police level, but on a community level, we're talking community safety. What if we did have full-time mental health support, right? And the same way the police have battalions with local beach cities if things get out of hand or whatever, we could share these resources, Manhattan Beach, Hermosa Beach, Torrance, and we can have full-time social workers, mental health workers dealing with, and I'm just giving a story, acute mental health crisis. We can have these same people dealing with uh, community substance use, domestic violence incidences, uh, child endangerment, maybe even homelessness. Civilians, non-law enforcement officers, with more extensive training that a police officer could ever have regarding some of the most difficult things that on its face value Fair, actually, to the police officers, I think it's something that really we shouldn't be doing. You know, so the, uh, support that idea. So I, I actually, you, you and I actually agree on this quite a bit. The only part that I don't agree with what you said is you said when you talked to the dad, you told the dad you should call the police. So you can't say police shouldn't be there when you inform the dad to call the police. Now, you didn't say what agency it was. I don't know if that was my agency or not. But one thing that the public or the community here in Redondo may not understand is that you and I agree on this 100%. That's why we have Department of Mental Health certified clinicians riding in police cars five days a week. Now, they're not 24-7. They should be. But the county and the Department of Mental Health should pay for it not the city of Redondo Beach. And that's where the rub is because the resources are very, very expensive. So we do share Department of Mental Health clinicians with other cities as well. Manhattan and Hermosa um, are, are the ones that we share one of those resources with. Then you went on to say, how about calls like domestic violence or homeless? Here's another thing that our community probably already knows. We have a 35 person domestic violence advocacy program, real pros in domestic violence. Hey, look, I don't want to do it. I, I do the crisis part. I do the calming part, hopefully keep everybody safe. And then the counseling part and everything else needs to be done by a professional. Couldn't agree more. So we have that resource. The other thing that we have in the city seven days a week is homeless outreach mental health clinicians, PATH, which is people assisting the homeless, and Harbor Interfaith, both on contract. And it's it's amazing, but they are with and built in to that unit I, des I described earlier, where we pour a lot of our resources, our Special Operations Bureau, they work in the same office. So we're on the same page, but um, the part that we are usually tasked with is the ugly part. We get called generally when things are out of control. And our job is to make it safe. And, and the closer that we bring those resources into the community, to the front line of each of those issues, 
the better service we provide to our citizens. So uh, I'm with you on that. But I don't want to assume, I don't want people to think that it's just officers out there. Um, it is not, not here in Redondo. I actually uh, speak often about the Redondo Beach Police Department when I do uh, speak on domestic violence. I spoke at their last event, and when I speak at schools, I talk about how far um, law enforcement has come in that regard, uh, because their domestic violence unit also has, you know, they have their care dogs, and they go out and they check on the kids. Those are some things that never happened or still don't happen in some departments, so we are lucky and blessed to have a department that does take that extra step to care for those that are in domestic violence situations, um, homelessness and mental health. And that's something that we also, you know, we talk about a lot in our um, community engagement board. So I did want to ask you, Chief, I got a question uh, that is there a civilian oversight committee? Is that similar or the same to the engagement board? And if it's different, how? Yeah, so it depends on how one would define that, but um, based on the question, I'm assuming this is something totally different. So here in Redondo, we have the community engagement board that you guys are on. There's no entitlement on that board. There's no vested power through this through the charter in the city that gives that board any type of uh, um, authority, let's say. Uh, but uh, and Goody can maybe speak to this earlier. When, when I when I talked about community oriented policing and the difference between a policy and an action, one of the things we do with that board, even though they don't have authority, is we give some of it to them. Um, we use members in our community to help us hire people. We use people on that board to sit on our promotional panels to make the decision, help us make the decision what the leadership in the future of the department looks like. So. That's our engagement board. Back to a commission. We also have in this city, via our charter, a public safety commission. Okay, They're, they are not, however, and this is probably the crux of the question, entitled to oversight of the police department via policy or discipline. Um, you Generally, when, when it's talked about a police commission, um, that, that's an oversight commission, generally people are talking about a commission that's involved in the disciplinary process or um, some sort of review of either policy or discipline within the agency um, that we do not have. What we have is after I hold someone accountable um, and, and provide a discipline, we go to a civilian binding arbitration in, in this city. That's how it works here. Very good. So one of the things that has been called for um, in the media is qualifying immunity and looking to see that in some other law enforcement um, legislation that, um, you know, will make people feel a little more like they have rights protected too, as well as the officers. Can you speak to us about for the public? You, you cut out, Tanya. Did I? Sorry. Maybe it's just what I was hearing. But. Qualified immunity. Can you speak to what that is and why it's such an issue? Uh, no, not really. I'm not an expert in qualified immunity, and I'm not sure exactly what you mean by giving qualified immunity to citizens. We we have that in with respect to the justice system, but um, I, I can't speak to what, what it is you're asking. Okay. So she's asking she's asking for qualified immunity for officers because oh. actually starting to review it now or they're potentially going to review it in the Supreme Court um, about removing qualified immunity for officers. Yeah, so um, in the justice system there is there is qualified immunity and, and a lot of these issues come down to the accountability and the discipline process. Um, it's very there, there are a lot of specific rights that are given to police officers under, um, it's called the, the Police Officers Bill of Rights. It's commonly referred to as POBAR. And um, there, are, there are certain rights that are there that make the process of accountability at times somewhat very difficult for management. And so those issues are constantly being talked about. Um, I will tell you that 
um, there can be a lot of work done in this area. Um, we have to be able to rid ourselves of bad cops. And I'm all for it. In fact, most cops will tell you they're for it too. We do not want a situation where if we have someone that's ill in the heart and we've got to be able to do more so that the public doesn't see the woes of that person out on the street. And sometimes it's very, very difficult. I, I have a question. I really, if, if that is true, and I hope it is, but it hasn't really been presented to the public in that way. I mean, the statistics for officers getting convicted, even in fatalities is like, I think I read something out of like 900 cases one time, only 34 were convicted of in fatalities, and those were convicted of lesser charges. Right. What about the police unions? Because if you as a police officer are a member of a police union, and the police union is the one who's advocating for a lack of accountability, even, like how does that, how do you guys have different stances? Because police unions have come out, um, I don't know specifically about Redondo Beach, but all over the country, in defense of reprehensible actions by officers. And it's it's hard for me as a citizen to say, yes, there's so many people out there who want accountability when even when they've actually gone through and tried officers and convicted them and removed them from the force, police unions go into arbitration and they have to reinstate these officers who've committed crimes. Yeah, so I'll, how does I'll, that work? I, I want to address a couple of things. These are some part of the discovery that uh, I had specifically regard to Minnesota, but some wider issues. Uh, in 2017, uh, I believe there was an incident in Minneapolis Police Department involving uh, their uh, sort of break room. Uh, during the holidays, a Christmas ornament or Christmas tree was put out. And on this Christmas tree, a number of ornaments were displayed. Uh, these ornaments were consistent with what we would call stereotypical or derogatory. So, for example, specifically geared towards African-Americans, there was an ornament of a Kentucky Fried Chicken, a Swiss bar liquor, uh, sort of a beer cut out, Kool-Aid, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this was brought to the leadership team within, I think, the fourth precinct, well, unfortunately, one of the precincts that was burned down. And that happened in 2018. Do you know there is still... There's still an arbitration process going on with regard to that issue of discipline. Uh, John Goff, who heads up, uh, who serves at uh, a, a, an academy in New York uh, for criminal justice, he's really well known. He's done a plethora of different workshops and facilitate discussions around issues of force and uh, bias, et cetera, et cetera. One of the departments he went to four years ago was the Minneapolis Police Department. And he talked in, in this article about how he noticed even the posture, the disposition of the officers and their lack of receptivity to some of the things he was weighing in on with regard to issues of diversity. And so specifically on this, what I have found, what I've seen, what I have read as uh, some of the greatest challenges with regard to issues of change in policy. I want to applaud our chief Kaufman for uh just some of the heroic work they have done. Shout out to our, we were talking earlier about our, our the people who serve the population of our homeless uh, here in the community, people like Officer uh, Keith Turner and others. But um, three sort of big, oftentimes, um, obstructions. Unions, which I'm generally for, uh, the Justice Department, and then this issue of litigation. Uh, with regard to unions, uh, in in uh, just over two years ago, over 1,800 officers were fired by their chiefs. 450 of those officers got their jobs back. That's a 25% uh, sort of percentage there. A lot of the officers who are disciplined, they're able to leave a particular fire. They're able to leave a particular municipality and go to another without any information being shared. That's in the current legislation that is before Congress. That's one of the things that there's an attempt to bring up. Rather than unions being a place where employees' rights should be guarded, they literally have become a fortress to protect officers. I've seen some of the most grotesque 
and inappropriate statements made by union leaders, even in the midst of the George Floyd case. One prominent, the largest union in the country, which has over 300,000 offers representative, 2,000 organizations, he's been suspended over in Florida for saying, hey, Minnesota, Buffalo, New York, hey, we're hiring. Secondly, Justice Department, under George W. Bush, 12 departments were being investigated for excessive use of force, being threatened with issues of con related to what we call consent decrees. Under Barack Obama, 15 departments. Under the current administration, one. That's a problem. So the lack of enforcement, the lack of accountability, so issues of unions, and I'm generally for unions, but it's very, very difficult to move policy and change forward when unions have become literally sort of a protectionist organization at any cost to the, the Department of Justice and their lack of uh, sort of accountability, holding people accountable. And then finally, litigation. For listen, over the last five years, the 10 major city police departments have paid out $1.2 billion. $1.2 billion with regard to excessive use of force. And so one of the issues is this qualified immunity, like where it's almost to the point where the Boyd family, for example, outside of the criminal uh, uh, mechanism, there is no regress for them. There is no regress. And I know we're in California, and they call this the sort of happy suit uh, state of the country. And I, I am not for frivolous lawsuits, but the lack of accountability on these three issues alone has in some cases, not in all, has given police departments to act with impunity when issues of culture and leadership and abuse of force are all in play. And I think that's part of it. There are very few entities, maybe outside of teachers, that have as much as broad latitude, sort of unfettered, unchecked. It's like once you get in, you're in. And, you know, I agree with the philosopher, the comedian Chris Rock, who says, you know, there's just some professions where we can't afford to have bad employees. You don't hear American Airlines saying, hey, most of our pilots land a plane on the tarmac. We have a couple of bad apples who every now and then run them into the side of the mountain. So these issues of accountability, these issues related to the Justice Department, even then to litigation, I think are critical when we talk about policy change. One of the changes, real quick, uh, Chief, you failed to mention that I think uh, I applaud you for, I'm so grateful. You know, you and I talked subsequent, and even before, I was in conversation with our chief before I went to Minneapolis, and one of the things that the departments all across the board necessarily do, does not have, it's in the legislation now, is if you observe a fellow officer abusing their authority in the context of executing their duties, you too can be held accountable. Do you know not all departments have that? Yeah. Redondo, <laughs> Beach, Redondo Beach has that, and I'm grateful for our chief having that, but these are some of the things that I think between uh, national legislation as well as enforcement within our Justice Department uh, and incentives, like federal support and monies. Uh, those 21st century police initiatives that proposed in 2014 by then President Barack Obama were non-binding they were that that whole commission and their recommendations were pretty pretty much done away with in the current administration, and a lot of those recommendations, we've adopted them. Long Beach has adopted them, but a lot of police departments have not. And I I can't help but think, what if an executive order, what if legislation, what if the current administration would have taken those on, as opposed to given the posture, as in the case of a 2017 police. Order national convention when the president of the United States stands up and says, hey, when you're arresting uh, criminals, I know they tell you to lower their head. You know, you don't necessarily have to do that. Words have meanings. And so if the idea of the understanding is if you're leading a police department, chief, you talk about this all the time. It's about culture. It's about leadership. And so when you talk about the police department, it has leadership. It has a culture. How can Three other officers watch one officer execute this man on the pavement, despite the fact that he outranks them. There are all, two of them are only on the force for what, less than four days in terms of their uh, in terms of out, outside of probation. Mm -hmm. You know how that can happen. 
when you have a culture, when you have lack of leadership. And so policies, yes, will help address some of these things, but also, too, we need some teeth with regards to some of these proposals and legislation. Yeah, I agree with you, Goody. Um, I agree with you. I agree with Joseph on that. And Janelle, I'm glad you brought that up. This is probably one of the areas where there could be incredible progress. Um, there, it's, it's very, very difficult under the current situation to hold some people accountable. And this is where real change can be made. So I hope I hope that uh, the conversation continues with this nationally. Um, a lot of people are not aware, and um, I'm, I'm not here to talk about one administration or another. I take the best from what I can get for the men and women of, of our department and for our city. Um, but I'm currently on the, it's called the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and the Administration of Justice. And there's 16 principles that are being examined here. Um, that report uh, will probably start coming out sometime in October. Um, the hearings are the hearings are happening right now, but um, there does need to be more progress in this. And and you're right. And and uh, the big unions, especially the really big ones. I mean, those are those are political animals too. They're involved in politics. It's involved in, with uh, with money. And and um, I personally have no, um, I have a very strong feeling about politics in, in uniform, very strong. Now unions don't do it in uniform, but they're political and um, politics and policing is not a good position. And it, it, it's only, it only creates issues. So I try to stay away from it, but, um, but yeah, you know what, goody for, um, for, for really diving into policing over the last few years, you, you, you know, you, you know, you can see it, and that's true. It is culture. We can we can mandate all the policies we want across the United States and say, here's all the policies. Everybody put them in place. That's not going to be change. Change is organizational transformation, cultural change within the agency, in the attitudes of the men and women of every single person in uniform. And we have to hire for that kind of excellence. We cannot afford one um, that goes astray. You're right. That that plane crash analogy is, is fine. We, we we crash a lot of planes. What about your thoughts on defunding um, the police? I know that's been the new call to action. Um, for so for the panel before we hand it off to Chief. I would love your thoughts on uh, defunding the police because I know it's the buzz term right now and some grief and some don't. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, just real quick, I am not for defunding the police. Neither is the current Democratic presumptive nominee. Neither is the President of the United States. Neither are members of the Congressional Black Caucus. Neither are members of, uh, of, of the of Legal Defense Fund, NAACP, et cetera, et cetera. A reassessment of funds within budgets, as in the case I think of L.A., uh, the mayor, uh, Garcetti. So I think it's semantics in some respects. Uh, but, yeah, w would it be worth our city or a city to consider taking three positions roughly at 100 grand and moving $300,000 uh, and looking to put that towards specific services? Absolutely. I, I think any organization that as a result of these events, whether you're a college, whether you're a sports team, a business, a police department that has not stopped in this seismic shift moment, that this matter uh, of George Floyd and the events that have transpired has literally disrupted the social, economic and spiritual and moral landscape of our nation. And so any business, any entity that has not paused to say, hey, listen. What can we do? I've, I've talked to school presidents who are assessing, hey, hiring issues and, uh, you know, scholarship issues. I've talked to, of course, our chief. And so I'm not for defunding of the police department. I love my police. Look, when I listen, when I call, I want them to be here front and center. Uh, I, I love them. I value them. I, I hold them in high regard. Um, but I do think it's worth looking 
add resources within various agencies within our local municipalities and governments? Where can we redistribute resources in order to address some of the systemic issues that may be uh, contributing to some of the issues of, of, of crime and poverty, lack of jobs, education, et cetera, et cetera. I'm all for that. I just want to... I'm also for the idea. Go ahead, Janelle. Oh, like when people hear defund the police, they think, oh my gosh, let's just take all the money away from all the police officers and we'll never ever have one ever again. And that is not the message. It is a reallocation of funds because all over this country, police departments take up a huge portion of the city's money, of the budget, of what the people put into the city. And just like we talked about, the police are dealing with homelessness, the police are dealing with mental illness. If we reallocate those funds, imagine if social workers and therapists had the same kind of benefits and pensions and all of these things that police officers get. You would get therapists and social workers and counselors who would work 24 hours. You would have three shifts. You would have homeless um, committees out on the streets. You would have a number instead of 911 to call, you would have a 211, a 311. Call somebody when you see somebody who's homeless and struggling. Those are the types of things that defunding the police is talking about. It's talking about reimagining a system that is proactive and instead of reactive. Because I'm sure like you know, Chief, that a lot of the problems and the interactions that you have are from people who are not getting the support early on. They're from people who are not getting intervention with drugs. They're from people who are not getting therapy. So if we as cities, as states, as governments say, let's put money into the problem before it starts, then your job gets a little bit lighter. Then the police funds and the system doesn't have to be so large. It doesn't have to take up so much of the budget. But in America, so much of what we do is reactive. And we really need to do some proactive support of our community. And that's not just for the police officers. All of you citizens listening right now, me too. You guys are the ones calling the police when you see homeless people just because they're there. We need to rethink how we look at our neighbors and, and we look at our people who are suffering from mental illness and who are addicted to drugs. We need to say where can we where can we fit them in our community to support them? Not let's throw them away and let the police handle it and put them in jail. So the idea of defunding the police is not let's take it down to zero. It's let's redistribute these funds so we can proactively help members of our community. And that means us as citizens stepping into those roles where we have those skills. Who better to take care of a community than its members? Yeah, so I think uh, defund the police needs like a new brand manager because it's like it's a, like saying that is a problem, right? Okay, so let's take that aside. We're going to do it like, like Elon Musk style, like reinvent first principles, solve the problem from the beginning. So imagine we're in the same building uh, that right now houses the police department on PCH and Diamond, but instead of being the police department, it's the Redondo Beach Health and Safety sort of bureau. And in one part of that building is the crime division that has our detectives and our police officers. Right next to them in the office next door has the 24 seven social workers that are employed by the city of Redondo Beach that deal with um, people having mental health, health crises. Uh, if there's a domestic violence call, something like that, right? Uh, Chief, Chief Kaufman earlier said, I called, I told the family to call the police because that's the system in place. Trust me, if Redondo Beach had a mental health department for crises, I would call that number instead of the police. So, okay, and next to that, if we're talking about community safety, right next to is, I don't know, the health department and the, and the city board that makes sure the buildings don't fall down because these are all public safety. And they'll all be next to each other because there's so many ways to define safety. There's so many ways to define community well-being. And crime is one aspect. We don't want crime in our community. And yes, the police have a role. Okay, but if you kind of took it from scratch and we didn't talk about it from the context and the viewpoint of the police, which is why deep fund the police is a confusing idea. But we talked about community well-being and safety, and then we had a budget. 
and we just started from scratch, it would make more sense for us to say like, okay, what is the best way? You know, I start off by talking about my role as a therapist and a community educator. And, and, and in my role, you know, it's, it's an expertise on human suffering, right? Like what do therapists do? What do we know best? We know why people suffer and all the ways that lead to human suffering. And the gist of it is people suffer because they don't get the right help at the right time. The right help, the specific help that they need at the right time. And I think if we're all just being open and we're not talking it through the lens of police, but we're thinking about the idea as a community of people, it just doesn't make sense that so many of these things that police are currently involved in should just not be involved in. Look, if there's a domestic dispute and a neighbor says, hey, dude, I heard my neighbors are fighting, imagine how different it would be if the knock on the door is like, hey, I'm the local therapist from the city of Redondo Beach. How can I help? And that person drove up, drove up in a, I don't know, Redondo Beach City Tesla instead of a police car that brings negative attention to the whole neighbor who is looking out the window like, what the hell's going on over there? And they just quietly walk in, and that couple is like, thank God you're here. And let's say we have the community resources. That person makes an assessment like, all right, you know, here's a list of local therapists. Dr. Lee is one of them. Maybe go make an appointment. He can help you, and that's the resource. Somebody's having a drug crisis. Yeah, an employee is a liaison. They go out there. And they're like, okay, cool. We got Clear Recovery Center over there. We have Little Company of Mary in San Pedro. We got Thelma McMillan. These are, and we got 15 AA meetings that you could go to. And here's five numbers you can call right now to help somebody help you right now who are volunteers from AA. I just gave two situations right there where it's so much more ideal. And in those situations, not only should the police not be involved, if the police show up in that situation, it escalates things to the nature of some sort of conflict. People are embarrassed. They're humiliated. It turns into a big deal. And they're already in crisis. So it's just, so if we took a first principles approach to a lot of these like community suffering and community health and community well-being, community safety, then all of a sudden we're like, okay, let's take some of the funds that we're paying for the police as a community and redistribute those funds, Right. And I think that's the concept. So yeah. next time you hear defund the police, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about that, you know. That's good to hear. But um, I think one of the things I wanted to make sure that I let you know is, you know, one of the things I've learned from um, Chief Kaufman and Captain Naylor is why kids grow up um, to either like or dislike the police, right? Like their first time... Uh, having an experience with an officer, where should that be and how should that be? So I start thinking about how we see officers in our schools now um, at an elementary school level, at the junior high school level, at the high school level. They're there in a manner to just be there, right? So that they can start building trust in the community. So when I start hearing defund the police, those types of things to me start to go away. And then I have to really look at, well, who, who's going to teach that lesson, right? Because then that's something that you miss. Your um, experience, because there's not a lot of us in these schools, and then you don't have them react, um, having interactions with officers if that becomes the case, if they get defunded or those funds get put somewhere else. So some of the things that an officer does, uh, I don't know if it can be replaced by somebody in the community. So just being a community member at a school looks different than being an officer at a school. So when I hear defund the police, it scares me a little bit because I am someone that I'm a gun violence survivor. I have had over a hundred encounters with the police before I was 18 and most of them work to save my life. So not having them around or not being available, that has more fear in me than a lot of the other things that um, you know we're afraid of. So it's kind of a give and take, but I think it has a lot to do with culture. Um, and we are blessed to have a culture in Redondo Beach that fosters these kind of experiences. 
but not everybody else is like that. So when they start talking about defunding the police again, is that something that can be a localized thing or state thing or, or whatever, chief? Um, or if that's something that they implemented, would it be for everyone? So what does that look like to you? Could it be localized? And, you know, how do you see that affecting the department? And do you even see it happening? Let me be perfectly clear. Anything regarding defunding law enforcement, I think is a ridiculous idea. I will go to the other extreme, and here's why. The most vulnerable people in our societies are the ones that need the police the most. If you start removing funds from law enforcement and they cannot get to those people, they're the ones that are going to suffer. And I, I understand you guys are shaking your heads, but when you knock on the door during a domestic violence and you say, hi, I'm your local therapist, if that person does not want to deal with you and continues to beat on that person, you're going to call the police. Law enforcement, here's where I will agree about the restructuring. The funds that are in policing and inside police departments, in my opinion, I only run my department, but they need to be readjusted into proactive response to their community's needs, not a reactive force to the call for service only. Many police departments are set up that way. I like to describe it like this. I was, when I came here to Redondo and I, I took a deep breath and I, I, I looked around for a few months and I listened to the radio and I started to establish, okay, what can we do here? I was, I was describing it like this. If you had a straight line and you, and you took a segment of the line, a small segment in the front, and you said, this is the enforcement part of our job. This is what we have to do regarding enforcement. The rest of that line, that's what we have to do. The rest of the line, this is what we can do. So I started adjusting the deployment of our resources into many of the things that we're talking about here. If funding goes away from our police department, the progress in those areas that have made the difference in Redondo Beach to cause a 24% drop in crime over the last five years, those will go away first, a large side of the line will shrink, and we will be back to the reactive police force that nobody on this panel wants. So defunding the police, to me, is not a sensible notion. Now, if we can create this utopian society where crime diminishes and the function of what it is we do can be replaced with something else, the therapist knocking at the door, then so be it. But I'm telling you that today, 2020 in Redondo Beach, I'm not calling for the shrinking of my department. I had 90, 95 officers. Um, I was calling for 105 to get us to be able to take care of the needs of this community. And a lot of those needs are proactive, not reactive. So uh, defunding, defunding the police, not a, uh, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. I just wanted to speak really quickly to what Tanya was saying about your first introduction to the police officer being in school and also the reallocation of funds. Why can't our first, like police, almost every kid I know has met a police officer, but almost every kid I know has not met a therapist in their school or a psychiatrist in their school or someone who they know that they can talk to. We have a lack of counselors. We have a lack of art. We defund education all the time. It's regular. Funding gets cut all the time. Teachers are out there protesting and marching just so they can have the basic needs. There's classrooms here in LA and Carson, all these places that have 40 students to one teacher. We're used to defunding things in this country, but we defund things and we think, and then what we defund ends up creating bigger problems for the police. When you have lack of education, lack of support, lack of resources, you have people who are suffering and then people who are suffering and need support, they make that poor choices. So what we are saying is, I personally don't wanna see any officers at my kids' schools. I don't see officers at my kids' schools and that makes me feel safe because I've read stories of six-year-olds getting arrested. I've seen, I've seen the images of little girls being thrown on the ground by police officers. Those are real things happening too. 
So not in Redondo Beach, they're not. If we're going to be talking about a very with that, don't paint us with that brush. I'm not. I'm not painting. The parents of this district want the cops in schools. I'm. I. I live in this district too, and I don't. And I. I can probably tell you a lot of people. Your kids are in school. What I'm saying. You told me that your kids are not in school. They go to school a couple of days a week, and they're on a campus. So you do not know at the campus. <laughs> No, my kids don't go to school, Redondo, but they have gone to school, Redondo. They went to Washington Elementary. But I feel like you're challenging me and not letting me speak. But when, when you talk, we all let you speak. So I, I just don't feel like that you're respecting my voice right now. Like I said, when my kids, what I want in my kids' school is a therapist, is a psychiatrist, is an art teacher, are people who support the needs of students. That is what those people do. They want to support the needs of students so they don't have to have negative interactions with the police, so they don't get on drugs, so they don't commit acts of domestic violence. Most of the people who do crimes are people who have lack support, who've experienced trauma, who are on drugs. There's all these interventions that could have been made early on. So I think as a society, we need to reimagine, like you said, she, a, a more utopian place where we actually meet the needs of children and people before they have to interact with the police. That, that is what we're aiming for. But if we continue to say, well, it's not like that, so we can't do anything about it, so let's just keep funding the police because it's not like that, and I haven't been safe, but even the interactions that we've had with people are not safe. All of those people, at some point in their life, many of them have not had the support that they needed. So if we can meet those needs, then many of us, all of us are safer. The police are safer. Well, here's the question. The here's the question. Is it something that can be done localized? Because I don't believe that every city, every area has the same needs. And that matters. Being able to customize what we need in each community matters. Is that something that we can even agree that can happen or should happen? is having those needs supplemented in the areas that are needed or repaired or fixed or reallocated. If there are areas in um, school districts that need certain things, then the money is distributed differently because we can't paint everything with a broad brush because our education system doesn't need the same as Inglewood's education system. Every school district is different. Every city is different. So is that something that we can even agree on in regards to resources and allocating resources and what things should look like? A hundred percent. I will tell you that, that um, many parents in America are worried about the bad man coming onto campus and shooting their kids. You know, just because this thing happened in the U S doesn't mean that that goes away. And so um, that's why our philosophy here is to ingrain ourselves into the schools and to be there when there's not a problem so that we're not seen as the problem uh, just because we're on campus. We don't want the police to be associated with it, that there's an issue. One of the things, Tanya, I think that could help solve this problem, not just for our agency, but, but any community, is you have to figure out how to take the pulse of your community to see what it is that they actually want and think. If you ask a lot of law enforcement leaders, how's your department doing? Oh, we're great. How's your community support? It's wonderful. How do you know? A lot of times they know by the interactions that they have with people in the community that are always there. Those are the ones at the council meetings. Those are the ones that come to the town hall but it's maybe not the actual pulse of the community. So one of the things that can be done is getting into the community, using technologies to survey the community constantly to figure out how you're doing. So here in Redondo Beach, we do those, we do those surveys and we base them on how safe people feel and how much trust they have in us. When I see trust levels go down in an area we do something about it so that people begin to trust us more. When I see safety go down, we do something about it so that people feel safer in their communities. 
And then the other thing we can do, we have to be an open book and we have to be transparent. Everything we do, we have to give the community a voice to tell us how we did. And so there are technologies available. We have it here. You can read about it on that report where every time we're called, you get to tell us what you thought. The officer have a bad attitude. Did we do good? Did we do bad? And then we can rate that. And then we can change what it is we're doing that people don't like. Um, but we have, to be, we have to be open and honest with people um, to get a feel for what is it they want. I know that here they want our cops in schools. In fact, they wanted more than what we have. So the district itself chipped in to pay for additional. And it's important. Um, maybe that's not important to everybody, and I get that. But the overall consensus is that it, that is very important in our district, and it's very important to me, because we have 10,000 students, and if we can touch the lives of each and every one of those, and and then through their families, their parents, their aunts and uncles and grandparents that live in the city, we reach almost our entire population in a very short period of time. And that's the goal. It's the relationship between the public and the police. Um. Before we go, I do want to address some of the things that have been uh, spewed on social media uh, because most of us uh, at least look here and there and, and some of the misinformation that gets uh, passed out there. You know, there's the whole Black Lives Matter, there's Antifa, um, a lot of incendiary things are being said about groups that frankly are people that look like us. And many times that's not right. Um, Black Lives Matter and Antifa are uh, being characterized as terrorist groups. Like those types of things are on social media pages in Redondo. So my question to you, Chief, before we go is how does your um, department manage those types of things? How are these groups seen? And how do we make sure that we stay up to date on accurate information instead of um, being incited by uh, kind of rumor and innuendo that gets spewed out there on social media? That's a, that's an awesome question, and I'm glad you raised it. Um, it was never as important as I've seen it over the last couple of weeks here. Um, we saw entire communities getting boarded up because of fear, and I had to personally walk our business districts and talk to people, and they would, sit, they would ask my opinion on should I do this or should I do that? And it was all based on what you just said. Well, I saw this on social media. And then this got forwarded from this person. So what we did and what we currently do is we vet out to the best of our ability the truth behind those posts to see what is real and what is not. Um, and we try to act on real intelligence. Um, and a lot of stuff was spewed out on social media to distract the police from doing different things or moving to different areas. Um, but with some of our resources and able to, to vet out some of this intelligence, uh, many people don't know this, but starting on Monday, um, once, the, once the, the, the rioting started to subside, that Monday when the curfew went in place in Redondo Beach, we stopped over the next four days, eight different cars that were full of products that had been stolen in the looting from Santa Monica, Long Beach, and from LA, um, and were able to make arrests because those people still had bolt cutters, axes, bats, and hammers with them to do harm. Um, a lot of what we were looking for was based on good intelligence. So what I asked the public to do is when you see stuff like that, forward it to us and avoid posting it yourself or forwarding it to your friends. Because one, one post, um, I, I remember the one about, I don't know how many people heard about our, uh, um, the shopping center in El Segundo had been completely destroyed and looted. And it caused panic and fear, and it wasn't true. So um, I would just ask that members of the community forward concerning things to us so that we can vet them out and see if they're actually real. All right, Christian, you want to go ahead and shut it down? 
Yeah. So, you know, uh, first of all, I, I want to thank everybody who is, uh, who's been listening in and I know we didn't get to, you know, any questions and answers from the public. And I, I see a lot of comments, uh, on the zoom thread here. And, and I think a lot of those comments, you know, we're probably going to need to address. And so I'll make sure that this whole chat gets sent off to each of the panelists, um, uh, because things did get a little dicey there. Um, you know, this, as I said at the beginning, uh, this is the beginning of a conversation. I, I, it's not the end. Uh, and I, I don't know if I, I mean, I can continue to try to facilitate this uh, and, and host these types of talks, but I, I don't want it to stop because clearly, you know, there are some areas where we're missing each other and we're not truly listening or hearing each other. Uh, and and that's okay. That's, that's a part of the process. Uh, you know, communication can be dicey. Um, the status quo is a powerful thing, and and uh, uh, I I do believe though in my heart of hearts, and I always have believed that we have the power to to do better, uh, to be more empathetic, to hear each other out, and to to make you know progressive change. Um, so thank you to the panelists for for really putting yourselves out there um, in a raw way. I, I truly appreciate that. Thank you to everybody who signed on and uh, was able to make it into the Zoom meeting. I apologize to everyone out there who was uh, stuck in the waiting room. I didn't realize that Zoom had a hundred person capacity. Uh, so hopefully you'll be able to watch this on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. Uh, and then uh, I'll just finally end by saying, you know, I'm going to do one more town hall, um, hopefully with Dr. Lee uh, around COVID and anxiety and stress and mental health. Um, but uh, if you have ideas for other town halls or uh, topics for a community meeting, just feel free to contact me directly and, uh, and let's keep doing more of this because I think we're making progress just by even talking about it. So I appreciate all of you and thanks, thanks again to each of you and the panel for, for joining us tonight. Thank you.